you look over here, we can see um, some typical aerials. Now, this aerial here, which you might just be able to see, is a so-called dielectric aerial, which is, um, which is designed for uh, Bluetooth applications. And so the wavelengths will be quite long, but we've played it some tricks in the design stage, used some dielectric material, and we've ended up with an aerial which is just a few millimetres long. So as we walk along, I guess uh, you see aerials everywhere uh, on the tops and roofs of uh, almost every building. Well, we can, see, uh, we can see a mobile phone mast on the top of the hospital. We, uh, we certainly depend on them almost uh, for our routine daily lives, from everything from a, from a mobile phone, of course. Mobile phone, there we are, everybody, everybody knows what they are. Uh, this is the back of the physics uh, building, and uh, if, you, if you look at the, you see the dome of the ordinary conventional uh, reflector optical telescope, but today we're a little bit more interested in how these different aerials work. This is the radio telescope uh, uh, system, a single uh, radio telescope dish. A radio wave comes in here, uh, flat, parallel, hits this curved surface and then bounces off to the focus which is uh, the aerial here. So the only aerial in the system is inside uh, that, little, uh, that little shield there. This, uh, this aerial is tuned to around about 1.4 uh, gigahertz, um, so that's much higher than the normal radio transmissions that we're, we're used to hearing, but around about the sort of mobile phone uh, transmission uh, area. What this is actually looking at is, is the um, natural emissions from uh, hydrogen. Now, if I was to hold a bucket of hydrogen here um, in front of the aerial, we wouldn't see anything at all. We wouldn't pick that signal up because um, what, what we're looking for is very, very rare spin-flip events in the, in the hydrogen itself. And that, that, that is so rare that we would never be able to detect it here on Earth. But when you've got a galaxy right out there, with billions and billions of tonnes of, uh, of, of uh, hydrogen gas, then that's enough for these rare events to become quite a large signal. Well, this racket, I've, I've been trying to receive uh, my radio station and um, I appear to be getting lots of crackles on my, uh, on my radio set. I, I hope, you can, uh, hope you can hear them. Put them near the, uh, put them near the microphone there. Now. Where are, they, where are they coming from? I've got a good idea. Let's go and find out. Getting louder. Just to prove it. You see, it went. Well, what's going on in this, uh, this piece of kit? We've, we've got a, um, some power supplies. So the electrons are piling up on this, uh, on this little tip uh, over here. And then when the voltage is high enough for the, um, for the air to break down, just like in a, a thunderstorm, in a, in a lightning strike, then the electrons will jump across, uh, across that gap. Just for a moment, um, this, is, uh, this is a single electron. If I, have, uh, if I have a charge, then that produces an electric field, uh, which radiates out. But probably where you're standing, Brady, you probably wouldn't be able to pick up that electric field from, uh, from there. If, if my electron is traveling at a constant velocity from one end of the tube to the other, we call that an electric current. Now, of course, I'm going to be in trouble from my physics colleagues because a real electron doesn't travel that far, it only travels a few microns, uh, perhaps, in a metal. But uh, it, this, is a good enough in, this is a good illustration. So what does that do? Well, that produces a current, of course, and because the current is flowing, that produces a magnetic field around that. But that isn't enough. That isn't, that isn't going to produce our uh, radiated wave. What, what produces the, the wave is 
when the electrons start to oscillate up and down. So we have an alternating frequency, or we could call that an acceleration. So in the spark gap, we had our electrons pretty much stationary on one side of the, one side of the uh, gap, and then suddenly, whoop, they're accelerated over the gap. And so when you've got an accelerated charge, you've got not only the electric field radially, but you've also got an electric field tangentially along the, uh, along the aerial like that. And it's the combination of those two effects, the magnetic field and the tangential field, which produces the relationship, the orthogonal relationship between the magnetic and the electric field that couples to this travelling wave. What happens at the other end is, let's say we've got our, we've got our aerial, we've got an aerial here, that's um, just, a, it's just a piece of wire. And inside that wire, we've got, um, we've got stationary conduction electrons. When a wave comes in from our transmitter, it's not very good because I'm moving anyway. When the wave comes in, literally, it makes those, it makes those electrons move in sympathy. And of course, that, is a, that means that there is a voltage at the, uh, the base of the aerial, which I can then, uh, then pick up with the electronics and the receiver inside there. OK, so why, why are aerials a certain size? Um, and we've got a, we have an FM type of aerial, and we tune it to local radio station, which is, say, uh, say 100 megahertz. Then we'd expect the wavelength to, of, that, of that wave to be 3 metres, and sometimes we refer to wavelengths in, in metres. Radio waves can, uh, can occupy um, a variety of, um, uh, of wavelengths. Uh, we, do, we only have to look at our radio uh, dial. Um, the seldom used um, long wave, of course, is literally <laughs> means long wave. And so Radio 4 uh, long wave is actually 1,500 metres long. So what is that? That's three and three quarters round, times round the running track. So that's how long the wavelength is. When we get to... Um, our FM wave band, um, which is around about 100 megahertz, 100 million oscillations of that uh, little ten table tennis ball um, per second, then the wavelengths come down to around about two or three meters. Um, so what's two or three meters? It's that sort of length. Okay. And so the best aerial we actually can build is when we have a quarter wavelength. So when that's a quarter wavelength long, we get a good, uh, a good antenna. However, when we go up in frequency and we start talking about our mobile phone type of aerials, which are uh, a couple of gigahertz, so that's 2,000 million cycles per second, then the aerials can be probably a little bit smaller. So probably the wavelengths are 10 centimetres. And so we get aerials which are perhaps a couple of, uh, couple of centimetres. However, we can play a few little extra tricks because you can't see an aerial on this, uh, on this phone. And in point of fact, by slowing the wave in a so-called dielectric, just like a refractive index optically, then we can play a few tricks. We can, make, we can actually make our aerial effectively smaller by surrounding it in a block of uh, dielectric, like a plastic in a, in a sense. If you look over here, we can see um, some typical aerials. Now, this aerial here, which you might just be able to see, is a so-called dielectric aerial, which is, um, which is designed for uh, Bluetooth applications. And so the wavelengths will be quite long, but we've played some tricks in the design stage, used some dielectric material, and we've ended up with an aerial which is just a few millimetres long. This is um, a patch antenna which is used for global positioning system antenna. So that works at about one and a half uh, gigahertz. And the actual aerial is this square plate um, of, uh, of, uh, of conductor on the top. Well, loads are so small, and uh, that's quite good. Otherwise, um, our aerials on our mobile phones would be bigger than the phone, which, of course, if you're old enough like me and remember the first mobile phones, of course, they were. <laughs>